So that means consonants, the idea of something sounding good. That's a, like kind of an uh, oversimplification, but consonants is just polyrhythms which are easy to hear slash feel. That's all it is. I'm sorry, edutainment music YouTubers, but uh, nope, consonants is not actually uh, determined by simple ratios between fundamentals. First, we have to talk about what consonants actually is, which is a little more tricky than it sounds. First of all, there are actually two kinds of consonants, simultaneous and sequential consonants. Sequential consonants, also known as horizontal consonants, refers to uh, how notes sound in the context, in temporal context. Uh, you might have seen this Jacob Collier video. If I said, like, does this chord sound good? And I played uh, this chord. You might say it's a bit weird. I'm not quite sure I understand what that sound is. But then if I went... Then the, all those notes make sense. That is an example of sequential consonants. That is not what we're going to be talking about today. We're going to be talking about simultaneous consonants or vertical consonants. Uh, how intervals sound without any musical context around them. So what does it mean for something to sound even consonant or dissonant? Uh, I hear some people describe it as pleasantness, but I always find that these analogies to emotions or feelings are pretty much inadequate for describing what consonants and dissonance actually are. I think it's something that's just really hard to define. It's kind of its own thing, um, because, of course, these things are going to be culturally coded. And to give credit to these YouTubers, they're generally pretty good about explaining how cultural context of the listener is going to uh, determine what they consider to be uh, consonants versus dissonance, uh, that is going to play a very big role. But it is not the entire story of consonants and dissonance. And of course, neither is the simple ratios explanation. Uh, so here are a few disproofs of that theory. Uh, the first is gamelan music. Gamelan is a wonderful musical tradition that I love, and that's actually how I started thinking about this, because I was listening to gamelan music and I know that Gamelan uses various tuning systems which are not 12-tone uh, equal temperament. They're not really related to the Western tuning scale. Um, they divide the octave into a completely different uh, system. But the music still sounds consonant. And I was thinking to myself, how can that possibly be when the Western tuning system is supposedly based on these simple ratios that are the basis of consonant? But even to my Western ears, when I listen to gamelan tuning, uh, it still sounds consonant to me. Another pretty easy example of how simple ratios can't be the only explanation of consonants is, let's say you take an octave, that should have a simple two against one ratio, but now you take the upper note of the octave and you raise it in pitch by something like 0.01%. Now, you know, the ratio between the, that interval is going to be extremely weird and complex, but it will still sound perfectly consonant to us. I mean, if this were true, then the entire 12 tone equal tempered system wouldn't work, uh, because these ratios aren't the simple ratios of just intonation. What you hear on a piano, what you hear in almost all Western music, aren't these simple ratios. And yes, the simpler uh, ratios of just intonation sound purer to us, uh, but the complex ratios of 12 tone equal temperament don't sound completely insanely dissonant like you would expect, it, even though they have very comp some of them have very complex, uh, some of the intervals have very complex ratios. But the most convincing uh, counterexample uh, is going to be this, which shows that given uh, some sort of inharmonic timbre, uh, an octave, which is supposed to be the most stable interval that isn't unison, can actually sound dissonant. And this video is going to hint at why. First one is normal harmonic spectrum. I will play A equals 220 Hz and A an octave higher 440 Hz. Sounds like an octave. And now stretched harmonic spectrum. You can see that I am playing the same pitches, so the ratio between them is exactly 2 to 1, as it should be. But they sound kind of dissonant. It is because you can see on the spectrum the partials of notes don't align with each other, 
that misalignment causes beating between these partials. Now, while we're here, I think we should address another one of my minor pet peeves with uh, music theory edutainment YouTube, which is that they tend to use the terms harmonics and overtones interchangeably. Those are not the same thing. Uh, overtones are, you know, the natural tones that give sounds timbre that are above the uh, sort of fundamental frequency. Harmonics are specifically overtones that follow the harmonic series, i.e. one against one, two against one, three against one, four against one, five, and so on. But not all sounds follow the harmonic series. Not all sounds have overtones that follow the harmonic series. Uh, some examples are bells. Bells are inharmonic. Uh, crash cymbals, anything that sounds like a, like a shh, white noise kind of sound, like a, a waves or, or a crash cymbal or white noise, you know, any, anything like that is going to be inharmonic. It's, it's uh, overtones don't follow the harmonic series. So what was that video? Well, this guy from the YouTube channel New Tonality made a synth sound which uh, the the overtones of that sound are stretched. I it's the same. You take the 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 regular harmonic series and you equally pull everything apart, right? So so all of the notes grow further, or like all of the pitches, sorry, uh, of the overtones are pulled further apart from each other than they would be in the harmonic series, so they no longer have that simple relation to the fundamental in the harmonic. They don't they no longer have the relation to the fundamental that follows the harmonic series. They now have a completely different relation to the fundamental, uh, but they're all changed. The way that the ratio is changed is the same. The transform is the same across all of the pitches, um, in that it's stretched to, so that the distances are further between each note, but they're equally further between each note, or each pitch, sorry, uh, if, you, if you follow that. So uh, what this proves is that timbre is what tells, it's what tells us if something is consonant. It's, it's timbre, because just by changing the timbre of the sound, the same interval between uh, the, the same the same interval now sounds dissonant because those overtones are clashing. They are having interference with each other. He describes beating, right? Beating is this effect where two notes that are kind of close together have a kind of like a whoop, 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 whoop sound. You can hit, you probably heard it with, with sort of bass tones, but this affects all frequencies. It's just harder to hear with higher pitch noises sometimes. Uh, and, you know, there are other ways in which sounds can clash because they're just waves and, and waves have interference with each other. And so the reason things sound consonant is because uh, when you have uh, fundamental frequencies related by a simple ratio, those uh, and those fundamental frequencies have above them overtones that follow the harmonic series, if you are playing intervals that also follow the ratios of the harmonic series, then the overtones are going to lay completely over each other, right? They're going to not be uh, these awkward beating, clashing distances between each other. They're going to uh, just just sound sort of the same. And so, you know, the, 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 the pitch of those overtones is, is the same. And so you don't get this clashing, beating sound. And where they're not the same, the pitches are very different. And so again, you don't get these clashing, beating sounds. But with an inharmonic sound source, those, if you try to play the same ratios, suddenly those harmonics do clash. They do come in this awkward range where uh, the frequencies of the, the, the waves are interfering with each other. And so suddenly it sounds dissonant. And this makes a lot of sense, right? The further up the harmonic scale you get, or the, the, the more dissonant ratios, right? The, the more complex ratios that produce dissonant intervals like the minor second or the triad, uh, tritone, sorry, uh, are also going to be the ones where fewer of these overtones are aligned with each other. And more of them have this sort of clashing uh, uh, interference effect. It makes a lot of sense. So now what happens if you stretch the tuning by the same amount as you stretch the timbre, the overtones? What happens if you look at the new uh, sort of spectrogram you've created and now you build a new, t you, you take your existing octave and you stretch it by the same amount that you stretched the, the overtones. So now the sort of octave is in tune with the timbre, if you know what I mean. The tuning is in tune with the timbre. Uh, now these inharmonic ratios do have equivalence on 
the uh, keyboard. How does that sound? Now it sounds like an octave. And now let's listen how it sounds uh, played in the same stretch tuning, but with harmonic spectrum, with the usual spectrum that we uh, used to hear. And it sounds really bad. Isn't this fucking insane? All he changed between the two versions of Fur Release, all he changed is the timbre of the sound. And yet, in terms of consonants, they sound completely different. It Just by changing the timbre of the sound, you can completely change the perception. It's not to do with just the simple ratios or complex ratios between fundamentals informing you as to whether something is consonant or dissonant. We only know if those ratios are simple or complex based on the overtones of that particular sound source. I think that the the way general music theory edutainment YouTube describes this phenomenon is it's kind of a difficult thing to wrap your head around why these things are different. It's kind of like if I were to fry up uh, some food, right? I would take take a, 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 a burger patty or something and I was frying it. And I said, like, look, when you fry it and it goes brown, right, it tastes uh, really good because because of the brownness. When it food is brown, that means it tastes good, right? Like, you wouldn't be necessarily completely wrong. As in, you would be correct that if you were to fry something until brown, it would taste better. But it's not the brownness of the food, the color, that makes it taste better. It's the, the Maillard reaction releasing different flavor compounds, which both make the food taste good, right? And also produce a different color because of those chemical reactions, right? In the same way, the simple ratios between fundamentals aren't what makes sounds consonant. It's the clashing or relationship between the, the, the spectral and frequency relationship between overtones that make sounds consonant or dissonant. And it just so happens that those relationships are produced via, or, or rather, if you happen to have a simple ratio, you will also happen to have correlative overtones. It's not the ratio that causes it, it's the overtones that cause it. This is like one of the absolute coolest things in music. Uh, I really just wanted an excuse to rant about this because I think it's really cool and no one talks about it. Go subscribe to New Tonality, which is the guy I've basically stolen this entire video off and made a, a very oversimplified version of like all of his entire channel, which I am absolutely addicted to. This guy's fucking insane. Go watch all of his videos. He's, he's super cool. And I also stole most of this video from this paper, which is called... Uh, Simultaneous Consonants in Music Perception uh, and Composition by, uh, so, sorry, by, by, wait, I got timed out. I spent too long on the website and it, by, by Harrison, Peter, and Marcus T. Pierce. I don't know, but those guys, by Harrison, P. and Pierce. I don't know, but that, this, the, the Simultaneous Consonants in Music Perception and Composition, amazing paper. Okay, I read the whole thing. It's it's really long and it just goes through like every theory of of consonants uh, and like all of the the factors that play into it. It's really cool. I highly recommend reading it. And finally, if you yourself are a musician, mess around with inharmonic sound sources. Uh, there's been a lot of hype uh, around uh, you know microtonal music uh, for the past while. But there's a whole realm of another sort of side of the coin when you're stepping away from 12 tet, which is timbre. And in this example, we've been talking about consonants, but I really like this because it provides a whole realm of sort of alien sounding dissonances. If you're wondering why my album uh, Total Organ Failure Horizon sounds kind of fucking weird, it's because I tried my best to use as many inharmonic sound sources 
as possible. So I'm using certain altered tuning systems as well, uh, but I'm also using timbres that don't relate to the harmonic series. And that gives all the sounds this really fucking weird dissonant quality, uh, which makes the whole album, you know, kind of gives it this feeling of sickness and offness and unfamiliarity and alienness that I was going for. Uh, you know, the entire album wouldn't have happened if I hadn't found this new tonality guy and he hadn't shown me uh, what what inharmonic sounds were. And then I had done a bunch of research. So it's really cool.